Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. The epistle is written in the 26th verse of the 13th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwelt at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it also is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he said also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder, and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which ye, ye shall in no wise believe, 
though a man declare it unto you. Here endeth the epistle. disciples, peace be unto you, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Easter begins with Jesus already risen from the dead. We don't see him rising. We're not told about what happened in his resurrection. He is a passing over from death to life is an accomplished fact. He's passed over from death to life, from suffering to glory, but he's left the door open for those who believe in him to follow, to follow him in this same passing over. That's why the stone is rolled away, so that we may, as it were, enter into his death and discover his resurrection. And yet, as we know from our reading of the Easter Gospels, the empty tomb and the message of the angel even the witness of the women disciples was not enough. For most, it was necessary for Jesus himself to come to them. That's what we've been seeing as we follow the lessons appointed since ancient times for Easter week. 
So on Easter Sunday, we looked at the events of Easter morning, the discovery of the empty tomb, the angel's proclamation of Christ rising. And then on Easter Monday, the Gospel lesson tells us about the events of Easter afternoon, when Jesus walked with two disciples on the way to Emmaus and revealed himself to them in the breaking of bread. And today, on Easter Tuesday, that same uh, Gospel uh, account concludes with the events of the evening of the first Easter day, when Jesus appeared to all the disciples and invited them to touch and handle his body. They watched him as he ate some dried fish and honey, doesn't sound very tasty to me, and thus assures them that he is no ghost, but is alive in a life that death can no longer touch. Jesus comes to meet them, as we say, where they are, in their grief, in their doubt, in their perplexity, and leads them into restored and renewed fellowship with himself. And that's, of course, what he does for us, too. In their experience, we see what it means to share in Christ's resurrection, to partake in this passing over from death to life. We see what it means for his disciples, for us, and for the world. It means a passing over from doubt to faith. And with that passing over from doubt to faith, a passing over from grief to joy. And also from perplexity to understanding, becoming conscious and aware of the saving purpose of God to which the scriptures testified, now fulfilled in Christ's death and resurrection, and, as Jesus tells the disciples in today's Gospel lesson, also fulfilled in the Church's mission of proclaiming the Gospel in the world, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So the passing over, the Christian Passover, from death to life, from doubt to faith, from grief to joy, from perplexity to understanding, is also a passing over from sin to righteousness through the forgiveness of sins and through the justification of sinners. And that's what I think we should consider today. In the Epistle lesson, we have a specimen of the apostolic preaching of the resurrection which Christ had spoken of with his disciples on Easter evening in the Gospel lesson. It's a specimen of the apostolic preaching by St. Paul, and he's preaching to a synagogue of diaspora Jews and God-fearing Gentiles in a city known as Pisidian Antioch, uh, now an obscure, dusty town in the high, uh, dry plateau of Turkey. In this preaching is summarized the witness of the Apostles to Christ's death and resurrection, his rejection by the leadership of Israel, his vindication by God in fulfillment of the Scriptures. And at the core of Paul's sermon are these words, We declare unto you glad tidings, the Gospel, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to David and his seed forever. The promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. In the resurrection, God has kept his promise to turn the curse of sin and death into the blessing of righteousness and life. That's what Paul proclaims. That's the Easter Gospel. The curse of sin and death turned into the blessing of righteousness and life. And so Paul concludes his sermon. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. This language of justification, 
along with the forgiveness of sins, is indeed very characteristic of Paul's preaching, as Luke records, and as of his own epistles demonstrate, especially the epistles to the Romans and to the Galatians. And it's one of those words, those the theological words, theological jargon that floats around, and uh, sometimes uh, we have a very vague idea of what it actually means. It is indeed a legal, forensic word. It comes from the law court into theology. To justify someone means it's the act of a judge declaring someone righteous, declaring of a man who's on trial that he is not guilty, that he's not liable to any penalty, but on the contrary, and that he is entitled to all the privileges due to those who have kept the law. It is to declare someone not a sinner, but righteous. In justification, therefore, the judge rules not against the man on trial, but in his favor. And in place of the penalties of guilt, assigns him the benefits of righteous standing. So that's what it means in the context of the law courts. Paul is using the word justify to describe the first blessing of the gospel, deliverance and release from the penalty and punishment of sin, the forgiveness of sins. It's the one, the first blessing, that opens the door to all the other blessings of the gospel, to all the privileges that come with righteous standing before God. We are adopted into divine sonship, we receive the gift of the Spirit, and ultimately our own resurrection when he comes again in glory. Here and elsewhere, Scripture is insistent on the connection between the resurrection of Christ and the remission of sins and the justification of sinners. So, for instance, in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul will say, If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. You are still liable to punishment and as a sinner. So what is this connection between our justification and Christ's resurrection? I think we may understand it in this way. On the cross, as the scriptures testify, Jesus suffered for us, in our place, on our behalf, and for our benefit. He suffered for us at the hands of unjust earthly judges, though in fulfillment of God's purpose. He took upon himself thereby the judgment and condemnation that sin deserves, our sins. And since his suffering death upon the cross was done for us in our place and on our behalf, so also is his resurrection. It is for us in our place and on our behalf. And what is his resurrection? It is God himself delivering his son from unjust judgment and condemnation. God acquitting, exonerating, and vindicating Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God. In the technical language of the law court, the resurrection is God's justifying his son, declaring him righteous. And though we are sinners, yet for Christ's sake, who suffered and rose for us, God extends the same declaration of righteous standing, the same justification those who put their faith and trust in Christ and seek in him the fulfillment of the gospel promises of blessing, of righteousness, and life. So, when we believe in Christ risen from the dead, the first blessing of his resurrection for us is the forgiveness of our sins, is our justification before God, is our righteous standing, God has ruled in our favor for Christ's sake through faith, and he makes us thereby eligible for all the further blessings that follow on it, from the gift of the Spirit to our own resurrection when he comes again. As St. Paul says to Romans, 
being justified by faith, we have peace with God and hope of glory. This joyful Easter time, let it be our prayer and our resolve to put our whole faith, our belief, our trust, our confidence in Christ, who died for our sins and is risen again for our justification. Worthy is the land of the slain to see honor and riches and wisdom and power and strength and glory and blessing. In our prayers this Easter Tuesday, we pray for a grace so to believe in Christ risen from the dead that we may indeed enjoy all the blessings that follow on our justification. Even peace with God and hope of glory to come. Of your charity, I bid your prayers for the repose of the souls of the faithful departed. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church. Almighty and ever-living God, who by thy holy apostle hast taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee, most mercifully, to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may breathe the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also, so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, our Holy Father, to all bishops and other ministers. that they may both by their light and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments and to all thy people give thy heavenly grace and especially to this congregation your present that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear. Beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant us, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Increase, O Lord, our faith in thee, that we may work thy pleasure only. Let us pray. Most bountiful and benign Lord God, we thy humble servants, freely redeemed and justified, 
by the passion, death, and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, having our full trust of salvation therein, most humbly desire thee, so to strengthen our faith, and illumine us with thy grace, that we may walk and live in thy favor, and after this, this life be partakers of thy glory in the everlasting kingdom of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost ever, one God, world without end. Amen. Peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you, and remain with you always.